Okay, now I can properly thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity um, to discuss these um, intriguing uh, issues and progress uh, in recent years on the theory of SNARKs. And um, let's uh, start by recalling SNARKs from earlier years. The uh, SNARK concept goes back to uh, 1876, uh, Lewis Carroll's book on uh, uh, the hunting of the snark, and uh, as you can see, he foreshadowed many of the current discussions. In the book, you can find a succinct but uh, very uh, picturesque description of uh, someone generating and publishing a common reference string, followed by uh, a prover, evidently uh, picking an empty statement about the evaluation of some function, and uh, producing a very succinct proof, and eventually the verifier checks the succinct proof and uh, learns that uh, the prover knows a witness. And uh, that, in a nutshell, is uh, the framework of SNARKs. Uh, let's be slightly more explicit, but sticking with the spirit of informality. Uh, we will go more formal as the need arises. Um, we'll start easy. So the setup is uh, there's a prover and a verifier, and the prover has some very exciting statement to make about some function f evaluated on an input x uh, equaling y, or maybe there's even a, a witness for a non-deterministic evaluation or some secret information that uh, the prover keeps. And he makes that statement uh, that the result of applying f to x um, and perhaps w equals y, he sent that to the verifier, and he knows the, uh, the information that attests to that. He knows the witness w, he knows the eternal values that were used to compute the function. Now, to convince the verifier of the truth of the statement, he could have just sent over all of his private information. There are many reasons not to do that. Depending on circumstances, the information may be too large. For example, if the internal values are too big or if the witness is too big, um, the information may be sensitive, personal information, as in some applications that we'll see later. And therefore, the prover would like to uh, just uh, run the function f in his mind uh, and uh, somehow produce a proof to the correctness of the statement. Proof pi is produced, verified by the statement, by the verifier. And um, we would like this proof to have uh, various properties. So it should be convincing, it should be a proof. But as discussed previously uh, in the previous sessions, uh, it, it can't really be a proof while keeping the uh, other properties that we want, so we'll make it an argument, merely computational soundness. It will be non-interactive. We are, in this talk, we are uh, sticking to very uh, strictly to the non-interactive setting. It will be a string and no more that is sent. Uh, again, many applications require it, and of course it's always easier to uh, design protocols, uh, whether theoretical or practical, when it's just a string to send rather than interaction to perform. This will be a proof of knowledge. Now, that's a somewhat tricky property if you haven't seen it before. Um, informally, it means that the verifier equals means not, not merely that uh, the uh, prover uh, computed things correctly, uh, but that he knows that witness W in the case that it exists, and uh, actually uh, could have extracted it from his mind. Uh, had you really wanted to. And it's captured by the existence of an ex extractor algorithm that succeeds in extracting the witness whenever the verifier is convinced. Uh, this is a property that we will use uh, much more uh, tomorrow, so we won't formalize it now. Crucially, we want succinctness. Uh, the uh, verifier should run very quickly, and uh, the proof should be very short. And taking these together, we have the convenient acronym of SNARK. And often we will want another property, that of zero knowledge, making it a zero knowledge SNARK. Uh, in this talk, I will often simplify things and talk about SNARK when I really mean zero knowledge SNARK. And actually, everything will be discussed today is or can easily be made a zero knowledge SNARK. This won't be, it's not the case for all other constructions in other sessions and tomorrow, but today we can simplify. Now, um, we will be discussing pre-processing SNARKs when there's another party. There is a generator that uh, produces some keys, a common reference string that will be used by the prover and verifier. There will be a proving key 
and the verifying key, verification key, used by the respective parties. And this is produced ahead of time without knowing the particular X's and Y's and W's that will come up later. And it will be reusable over many uh, different uh, statements. <coughs> now, there are many variants of this uh, pre-processing model depending on what the generator algorithm is forced to do and the implications of its uh, going wrong. And uh, let's enumerate them. First, there's the question of uh, dependence rather than the typo on the, on the function f. Are we just uh, initializing some maybe a universal hash function that will help us uh, uh, produce snarks for anything, as is the case for the uh, uh, Fiat Shamir version of CS proofs, or are we doing something that is specific to the computation f? Um, the jumping ahead, the snarks that we'll be discussing in this session will have a dependence on f, and you can morally think about what the generator uh, is doing as creating a template for what the correct evaluation of f looks like. And then the prover will show that what it's really doing when the instances come in is uh, consistent with that template. That means in particular that the generator will be working hard. It will be working at least as hard as the computation of f. There could be snarks, and there are snarks where uh, there is some preprocessing, but it's cheaper, and that's another thing we'll be discussing tomorrow. Now, um, the randomness used by the generator might be public, making it a common random string, or private, making it a common reference string. And uh, in the case of private randomness, it means that there's a trapdoor that would enable uh, cheating provers to break soundness. And the soundness of the scheme uh, relies on uh, the fact that the secret randomness used by the generator will never be available to outsiders. As you can imagine, this is a concern in some applications. And another uh, variant is uh, who is convinced whether the uh, whether these keys uh, suffice to convince anyone in the world that they uh, trust the generator to have produced them correctly, or whether they are addressed to a particular party who has corresponding secret keys. And we'll encounter these two later in the talk. So we'll be focusing on preprocessing snarks of the expensive kind, where the preprocessing is uh, a, a, at least as, as expensive as the whole computation. And uh, a, you might ask, why are we focusing on the worst case here? And the reason is that this gives us the best verifiers in the non-interactive setting. Um, so we've so you seen variants of, of this uh, comparison slide several times today. Um, let me. Uh, uh, focus on uh, just a few entries from, uh, from those slides that are most pertinent to us. And this is a line of work that started just 2010 uh, with the work of uh, growth improved by LIPMA um, that uh, recognized uh, that uh, certain IKO inspired constructs can be uh, used uh, to, to achieve snarks. But well, um, the good news is that uh, they. Uh, it had very nice uh, proof sizes, small constant number of uh, field elements for cryptographically strong field, whatever that means. And um, the bad news is that they were still pretty expensive in the, in the um, amount of computation. If uh, the computation, say, circuit size or number of steps, depending on your model, is S, then uh, the common reference string was originally quadratic and so was the prover runtime. LeapMine improved the common reference string, but the prover was still quadratic meaning that non-trivial computation uh, would not be practical. And um, the work of uh, GGPR um, shortly thereafter uh, changed this picture completely. Uh, we are now completely in the linear or quasi-linear realm, and uh, the constants are, uh, well, a sufficiently low for useful experiments to be carried, and actually for some real-world applications that we'll be discussing as well tomorrow. And uh, something really cool is that uh, these proofs are not just constant number of small ele of field elements, but just seven or eight, depending on the variant. Um, and most of the work in uh, the last couple of years has been on uh, GGPR and in improvement, the uh, PGHR algorithm, uh, um, interpretations of GGPR, linear PCPs that we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see shortly, um, and um, 
various extensions. Um, another recent work um, it, it adapts these ideas from the uh, arithmetic circuit uh, field, which is where GGPR works best, to the field of uh, binary uh, constraints and binary uh, and Boolean, uh, uh, Boolean circuits, and uh, that improves the constant significantly for those cases, and even reduces the uh, proof size to just four field elements. So uh, we'll be uh, jumping into the fray and seeing how this works. Uh, what we'll see is uh, how the QAP-based construction of GGPR works, and I'll be boring interpretations and variants as I see fit uh, didactically. Um, and we'll see almost all of the details. We'll skip some of the uh, proofs and uh, at the very end some of the construction, but you'll get a good feel for what's going on. So what's going on is going to be quite a journey. So uh, I hope uh, there is no unfortunate interaction between the technical problems, the buses leaving, and the level of the reduction. Um, but uh, we'll start with some nice computations, some function f. We'll go through algebraic circuits, then uh, some uh, co uh, algebraic constraint systems of one kind, then algebraic con constraint systems of another kind, QAP, the namesake of this approach. Then we'll be constructing linear PCPs and linear interactive proofs, and at the very end of the reduction, we'll get the long sort snark. So let's go on hand. We start with computation, and uh, for consistency with the prior sessions, we'll be thinking about it as some function f. Uh, I can compute it on an input x and I'm producing an output y. Um, and it might be non-deterministic, so it would also have an input w. Uh, in the literature, often you won't find the y mentioned explicitly. Uh, instead, uh, it will be crammed as an input, then the function will be redefined as computing the, uh, the old one and making sure that uh, it's consistent with the y that's embedded in the new input. Of course, the two are equivalent. Now, uh, we need some representation of that function. Um, and um, here we will be working with arithmetic circuits. So we we'll assume we have some nice representation of the function as an arithmetic circuit over some finite field f. And we'll need large fields for this particular construction. Um, that's actually uh, overhead right now for us, because we'll be forced to deal with num large numbers, even if the uh, underlying computation is Boolean. But as we'll see, it also gives us some nice power in uh, exploiting the underlying algebraic structure of the SNARK for some applications. That is for tomorrow. So we have some algebraic circuit. Um, and um, um, that, that circuit gets the uh, input x and output y, make sure that they're consistent. Uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, the circuit would have some internal values corresponding to whatever happened inside f, in particular the witness. And we say that uh, this is satisfiable for x and y. If there exists a z such that c on x, y accept, uh, accepts with the uh, internal values z in particular. So now there remains to uh, give, give proofs for satisfiability of c for particular x and y. And uh, we want to represent this uh, in a more systematic way that will uh, lead us uh, to the next reduction. Uh, to this end, uh, we'll be using a rank one quadratic system, or R1CS. Uh, the notation is not quite that of GGPR, but close enough, kind of implicit in there. And the idea is that uh, from that circuit, we'll be constructing a constraint system represented as a bunch of triples of vectors that will be m vectors, each of these is a, j, b, j, c, j, and these vectors will all be uh, of k elements in our favorite finite field, the same one that was used for the, uh, uh, for the circuit C. And uh, we'll say that this I1CS is uh, satisfiable if there exists a z uh, in uh, f to the n such that all of the m constraints are satisfied, where the m constraints co each corresponds to a triple, and they say the following. Now, note this uh, funny tau here denoting transpose. So each two such vectors, um, we're actually computing their inner product. And um, 
this uh, funny looking notation simply lets us see exactly what matches what in the inner product notation. We'll be using this consistently for all inner products. Um, so um, we take the, uh, this vector here, and this vector, uh, what it, it contains everything that happens inside the circuit. The uh, inputs, uh, the uh, claimed outputs uh, of f that also goes as an input into c, and the internal values, and we also need the constant one stuck on top. And um, we compute its inner product with the vector aj, then we compute its inner product again with the vector bj, again with the vector cj, and each of these gets us a scalar. scalar. So we multiply the scalar and compare it to the third one. So, okay, we have a, for each j, we have three inner products and this simple constraints on the scalars, and we have m of these constraints, and somehow this is enough to uh, express any algebraic circuit. And actually, this is easy, easy to see. Um, for example, um, if you would like to uh, express uh, the fact that in the circuit C there is a multiplication gate, uh, that multiplies some value of the input x with some in internal value part that is part of z and is sent to the output, then uh, you choose a constraint j in which uh, the vectors aj, bj, cj are all zero except for these particular three entries, and it does the right thing. So that's multiplication. If you want addition, then uh, here we're saying that two elements of x are summed into y, uh, we compute the, this inner product that gives us the sum of the two elements of x, we multiply it by 1, giving that element of y. And in general, we can express in this way any bilinear gate. Uh, this includes addition, multiplication, negation, constants, and also, curiously, uh, weighted sums and other uh, things that uh, we'll be exploiting uh, in some applications tomorrow. So this reduction is uh, tight. There, there is completeness that we've just shown. There's also soundness. And it's even a, a suitably defined proof of knowledge in the sense that uh, uh, if someone knows uh, such, as z, is, such as z that satisfies this constraint system, of course, he also knows the z that satisfies the circuit. It's trivial. OK. So we have now reduced things to the rank one constraint systems, and now we get to the actual QAPs, quadratic arithmetic programs, the secret sauce of uh, GGPR and the follow-up constructions. Um, and these very badly rendered ve vectors, um, oh my, let's hope for the best for the rest. Um, so these vectors are what, what fortunately what we uh, saw a minute ago, and we're going to reduce this into a new representation. Um, here's the first trivial step. Here I didn't do anything except uh, mashing together all the vectors into matrices to get something that's trivially equivalent. Uh, instead of having uh, m uh, triples, I'm going to just have matrices of width m and uh, I will uh, multiply every matrix by this row vector, again, this transpose to make the uh, visual correspondence easier to see. And uh, clearly, uh, this condition is uh, equivalent to that. Note that I also uh, uh, moved uh, this term to the left, so I'm, I'm uh, multiplying uh, this uh, matrix by the vector, this ma the B matrix by the vector, and then the, I'm subtracting the C matrix constructed out of the uh, C vectors and the result should be zero. Now, why did I bother doing that, just grouping everything into matrices and making them equal zero? Because now I'm going to do something funky with these matrices. This is where things get, is, is get interesting. I'm going to really, really want to think about these as polynomials. So by now, you must, have, you must be very convinced by the power of uh, polynomials, especially interpolated polynomials, especially ones interpolated from small spaces into the whole field. So that, here it happens yet again. Um, for each row of each matrix, we're going to interpolate it into a corresponding polynomial in a strange way. We're going to pick some set S of arbitrary elements in the field, 
And uh, then for every such row, uh, we will consider the uh, elements of the row as the evaluation of a polynomial on the points in S. And we're going to interpolate that polynomial to, uh, to find it, uh, its representation over the whole field. So uh, for every AI, uh, sorry, for every row in A, the ith row, we'll be looking at AI, which is the polynomial that uh, uh, evaluates to, uh, a, to a, the right element, as in the matrix, at the corresponding point in M, where you can imagine the points of M written underneath. And um, we'll be keeping this polynomial degree n minus 1, which is the minimal degree needed uh, to uh, do this interpolation. Uh, so we have a nice low degree extension uh, for every row of A, of B, and of C. And now having done that, uh, we can define the QAP, uh, which is yet another representation of constraints, a different one. Uh, it will consist again of triples, um, it, it will be uh, a polynomial, but know that right now uh, the number of triples is different. We are now enumerating over the rows rather than over the columns. K here is the height of the matrices. And um, for every such uh, triple of uh, polynomials that we created uh, in that way, um, we're going to um, Um, compute uh, okay oh, sorry we're going to place it uh, into this construct right here so what do we have here again we have the, our favorite vector containing the inputs and the witness and the one here's another vector which is simply a vector of uh, polynomials containing the ka's this slightly corrupted vector contains the uh, k uh, I should say it should be k plus one, but let you know that. Um, a b's and the c's, and uh, now for every particular choice of x, y, and z, I can define these polynomials, these polynomials uh, a, x, y, z, in uh, the same formal variable by computing the inner product, that is taking the weighted sum of these polynomials according to the uh, x, y, z. Likewise for b, likewise for c. And then I can compute this polynomial, B, that depends on x, y, and z, and um, stare at it for a while and admire it. It's, it's a very nice polynomial. It's uh, just the right degree for me, and uh, it uh, represents uh, a lot of things I care about. It's, uh, well, it's derived from, from C and therefore from F, because uh, the, the polynomials uh, the, that it was constructed for were interpolated from the matrices A, B, C that represented the gates of the circuit. Okay, that's, that's nice. Um, it also contains information about the, uh, the claims about the X, Y, and Z. So maybe, just maybe, this polynomial will tell me whether um, the computation was correct. Maybe, indeed, uh, Z is consistent with X and Y. Uh, this would be the uh, bellwether from the previous lecture. And it turns out that this is indeed the case. The QEP is satisfiable, uh, we define it as satisfiable, if there exists uh, a z such, a, such that uh, uh, the, uh, the polynomial that we've just defined is divisible by another polynomial, which we'll call the vanishing polynomial, which is simply the one that uh, is defined by uh, taking the product of all terms of the form uh, alpha minus alpha j. So alpha is your formal variables in polynomial. Alpha j are the members of uh, the, uh, the set S. So this is simply the uh, polynomial of, uh, a, of degree k that uh, vanishes on all of S. Sorry, of degree m that vanishes on all of S. So, um, OK. What happened here? We have uh, a, a, some polynomial P, and uh, if P happens to be a multiple of V, then the circuit is satisfied. Uh, 
So put otherwise, if there exists uh, some polynomial H such that P equals H times V, then the circuit is satisfied. So this is somewhat strange to look at. What's the relation between uh, the divisibility of polynomials and um, uh, this equation on matrices? But actually, it does make sense. And the intuition here is that uh, the polynomial V, because of the way it was constructed as having all of the set S as its roots, uh, it generates the ideal of all polyno polynomials that vanish on S. So um, a, polynomial, a general polynomial uh, he will uh, vanish on S if and only if uh, it is a multiple of V. Now, vanishing on S uh, is exactly what's uh, happening here if you think about uh, a, a little uh, interpolation as uh, doing a mapping between um, a assignments uh, to the S field elements in the uh, columns of the matrix. And you can easily work out that uh, the two conditions are indeed equivalent. So we've managed to re-express the computation F as the visibility of polynomials and we even have this H, this nice polynomial H that serves as a witness that uh, the visibility really happens. And um, this is uh, just what we had before. Um, and now we can actually use this representation to do probabilistic checks. Suppose someone uh, claims that uh, they have a, 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 a suitable assignment Z that satisfies the QAP, and therefore the circuit, therefore the, uh, the F. And uh, suppose that uh, they actually write down that P and they write down the corresponding H, which is guaranteed to exist if um, that Z is indeed correct. Uh, and we would like to test them. So because this uh, equation should be fulfilled, we can just draw random field elements. Let's denote the randomly drawn field element by tau. Evaluate the polynomial P at tau, evaluate H on tau, evaluate V on tau, uh, and check whether uh, the equality holds for random tau. And this is a classical setting of uh, polynomial identity testing. Uh, we have polynomials of relatively low degree, smaller than 2m, and the field will be chosen to have much higher degree, and therefore we, have, uh, we will have very high soundness in this test, and of course perfect completeness. So if someone actually writes them down, uh, then we can test, but uh, we want to do better. We are after some uh, uh, local uh, properties that can be tested, uh, and uh, we don't want uh, very strong provers that will be hard to uh, compete against. We want to start simple and build up. And the simplest thing that, well, one of the simplest things that uh, um, uh, that we can ask the prover is to uh, just give us uh, a linear answers to our questions. Th that would be a very weak model of a prover. If we can uh, be convinced by such a prover, then we can amplify that to more powerful provers. So the prover will uh, write down a, a, a representation of his knowledge by, as the string pi containing 1, x, y, z, well, okay, the usual thing, things he knows, and also the polynomial h, which is his witness for the bellwether, his witness that the p indeed is divisible by v. And that we represent it as the uh, coefficients <coughs> of h. And once the uh, prover writes this down, we can make linear queries to this string and still check the condition that we've just seen before. How do we do that? Well, uh, one linear query to this string can, uh, com can compute uh, a weighted sum over, um, over a, 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 the information uh, of, about A, specifically the uh, Um, 
okay, I should say this more precisely. Um, given um, the, the information about this part of A is public. The information about Z is hiding inside Pi, which we're not going to read. We're just going to uh, query a, a linear functions of it. So we can choose how to query this Z according to our knowledge of A in order to um, compute this scalar here, where alpha is instantiated with tau. <coughs> Likewise, with the second query, we can uh, derive the, the scalar here, which is beta evaluated in tau. With the third query, we can evaluate um, this scalar. The fourth query will let us uh, evaluate uh, h on tau. And uh, for v, we know v v is public. There's no secret there. Um, it's uh, so we could factor that as, as part of the uh, the linear query. Overall, four queries into this string. Each of these is just a linear combination of its elements. Um, and actually, we'll also need a fifth uh, a, a query if we are really the verifier that wants to check a particular claim about x and z. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the x and z that we are having in our mind are indeed the ones in pi. Um, so this actually all works out and uh, soundness is maintained. Um, and what this means is that we have just constructed our first linear PCP. To be more explicit, um, we have a linear PCP where uh, the prover uh, given x, y, and z that fulfill our relation, that satisfy uh, the c or the r1 cs uh, further down the reduction, the prover can uh, compute the polynomial H, which is guaranteed to exist, compute its polynomials, and then output that string that we specified. And uh, then the query algorithm can choose a random field element tau and uh, the, the choose the queries according to tau. And uh, finally, decision algorithm will make sure that the values that we retrieved fulfill this relation which is just a matter of uh, a few uh, simple quadratic equations. So the decision algorithm is trivial. Um, the other two are, aren't that easy. Uh, we, have a, a, we have the prover that needs to find the uh, representation of H as coefficients. Now, that's actually uh, that, uh, fairly expensive. It requires uh, converting uh, an evaluation representation of H into a coefficient representation of H, put otherwise a Fourier transform. And if we do this uh, using a proper fast Fourier transform and tailor things just right, with our many moving parts in there to get it right, we can actually get very tight parameters with nice constants. Uh, the cost is roughly, uh, if we have M constraints, that, that is M gates in our original circuit, then um, the number of field operations in the Fourier transform will be roughly m log m plus uh, <coughs> um, the number of uh, entries in the matrices A, B, C, which roughly correspond to the number of gates times their in degree. And this is uh, for, for degree two gates, uh, well, fanning two uh, end gates and such. Um, this is dominated by the m log n term, meaning that we have a quasi-linear dependence of the prover on the circuit representation of the function f. For the query algorithm, as you saw, it's slightly tricky. It needs to find the right linear combinations. Uh, so that is linear in the, um, uh, in the representation of, uh, of f as a circuit. It requires roughly four n field elements again, plus the number of uh, non-zero matrices, uh, not matrix elements. So um, <clears throat> this is actually pretty nice. It means that uh, if we actually can carry, carry this uh, complexity all the way through, we end up with uh, quasi-linear things on the proving side, uh, very small uh, constants on the, uh, uh, on the decision side, which we translate to the eventual snug verifier. Now, one thing to note, uh, the decision algorithm here it checks a simple quadratic equation. Uh, it comes from here. 
And uh, this will be useful because later on we'll be, uh, when we'll be constructing SNARKs, uh, we'll need the uh, pairings to check them, and uh, pairings will only support these quadratic equations. Um, we also need uh, the, qu the query decision algorithm to be low degree for other reasons. So, um, one more note. Uh, so far, we didn't say anything about zero knowledge. Um, and now it comes into the picture. It turns out that for the, this particular construction of linear PCPs, we can get zero knowledge, or more precisely, honest verifier zero knowledge, very, very cheaply. The idea is that um, the prover, when he computes this polynomial P in order to create H, uh, to each of these uh, polynomials A, B, and C, he can add a random multiple of the vanishing polynomial V. So uh, this will not affect the completeness because we are anyway uh, factoring out multiples of V by asking about the visibility by V. But it will help us gain zero knowledge because now uh, the queries to A, B, and C uh, return random field elements, three independent random field elements, nothing learned there. The query to H, it follows from them. Uh, so if the instance is correct, um, nothing more leaks. It could be simulated. And um, the fifth query, the one the, that checks consistently with X and Y, that information is known to the verifier anyway, so nothing leaks either. So <clears throat> we got uh, honest verifier, zero knowledge, linear PCPs, which is nice because it uh, brings us to the realm of the uh, BCIOP paper that we've heard about before, uh, which tells us how to uh, take uh, a linear PCP and convert it uh, into first linear interactive proof and then uh, snarks of all sorts. So let me show you how that works. We've just constructed the linear PCP, and uh, first we need to uh, uh, bolster it a little bit, to give it uh, a little bit more power, would otherwise make it sound, even in the face of somewhat more powerful adversaries. Those powerful adversaries will be, as we'll see, uh, uh, what the proof system will encounter in the real world uh, after other attacks are taken care of. So the stronger form is uh, called linear interactive proofs, and the difference is as follows. In linear PCPs, uh, generalizing uh, what we've, uh, we've shown uh, a, 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 for the particular QAP construction, we, we, we have just finished with QAPs. We're now discussing linear PCPs in general. In particular, any similarity in parameters is purely accidental. So our linear PCP and linear PCPs in general are the form, there's a verifier and a prover, the verifier makes queries, which are vectors uh, over f to the m, and they get responses, which are field elements, but the prover cannot return to just anything. He's restricted to uh, return um, just linear functions of some particular vector that he has in mind. So the prover as a function of his x, y, and uh, W, um, it should be Z here, sorry. Um, if it all double, Z is derivable from W, so these are equivalent. So the prover <coughs> derives some um, um, vector in F to the M, and um, then all the queries are answered by taking the inner product of the corresponding query with the uh, vector pi that the prover picked. The, there is no freedom to change the uh, vector in the inner product as the queries streaming. And that's just what we saw. We had five queries, all to the same vector of pi that we, that we designated. Linear interactive proofs have a similar form, but still uh, deal with some uh, provers that are restricted to linear functions, but in a different sense. Here there are, a vector, there are queries which are field elements. We have m field elements going in, k field elements going out, and the prover gets to pick a matrix. That is a linear transformation from f to the m to f to the k. And uh, uh, the prover doesn't get to see the, uh, the queries before picking the matrix. Of course, uh, he picks the matrix, queries come in, are multiplied by H, queries come out. Um, and um, 
that's a different form, uh, but if this is linear, that is linear, surely they might be equivalent or maybe not because I'm asking the question and of course they're not. Um, because um, it, the prover here has more information. Um, in, if we just try to take a linear PCP and use it as if it were a linear interactive proof, it might fail because for linear PCPs, the queries are always the, in a product with the same vector pi, whereas for linear interactive proof, there's a matrix that uh, might have uh, different uh, rows and, uh, a, and therefore different queries will be answered by linear products with, uh, with different things. So. Um, um, we need some reduction, and this reduction, as BCIOP show, is actually uh, very easy. Uh, we add a, an extra consistency check that basically takes a random combination uh, and uh, makes sure that it's consistent over all of the queries made. So we take the linear PCP, we, uh, there were k queries, we add another k plus 1 query, which uh, uh, which checks a, uh, a random linear combination of all the other queries. And then we add that, and, of, and that for syntactic compatibility, we also spread out uh, the vectors into individual field elements. And it's easy to see that uh, we have now ensured consistency, uh, except with tiny probability, or at least when the field is large, um, any attempt to give inconsistent answers that the linear PCP did not expect would make that query detected. <clears throat> so that means that we now have linear interactive proofs, which gives, which takes us a lot of the way toward towards snarks. Um, if we can just force the world to be linear. So the sad thing about provers is that they're not always linear, even when we really wanted to, and even if the soundness of the system depends on it. So we have to force them to be. And um, BCIOP give two um, constructions for that, for the uh, designated verifier case and for the publicly uh, verifiable case. Uh, let's start with the designated verifier case. That means that uh, the verifier has some secret key that enables only him to verify and no one else. So um, another relaxation that, that we'll need to make in the reduction, or put otherwise another the requirement that we will make of the linear interactive proof, is that it is uh, input oblivious. But otherwise, the verifier has a particular restrictive structure. Um, it decides what queries to make, that is, what linear combinations to query from the prover. Um, and um, the um, decision algorithm uh, gets just these uh, queries as, uh, or information about these queries as these inputs. It does not see the uh, uh, inputs of the computation, the x, the y's. Um, these, are <coughs> these do not affect the query. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm sorry, the, that's incorrect. The, it does affect the decision algorithm, it does not affect the query algorithm. So the, the point is that the query algorithm does not see the x and the y. So um, we need this structure, the fact that the queries are independent, uh, as you'll see in a minute. And from uh, such input oblivious linear interactive proofs, we'll construct designated verifier snarks. And there's a really nice trick to that. Here's the construction. The snarks has three algorithms, the generator, the prover, and the verifier. We'll start with the generator. We'll start by running the query algorithm. Uh, note that it receives only randomness as input. input. It doesn't know the eventual x's and y's. That's why we needed the input obliviousness. And uh, then it outputs the queries that would be done. And the information that will help decide based on these queries later on in the decision algorithm when the answers come in. Now we're going to um, uh, somehow force the uh, uh, the the prover to work on these queries without understanding what they do, they will only be able to uh, compute uh, linear combinations of them. And the way that's done is by a suitable encryption scheme. We'll describe its properties in a sec. Um, so this special encryption scheme will have a, uh, an, a generator that creates corresponding uh, public encryption keys and secret keys. 
And then we'll take these queries and encrypt them to get ciphertexts, encrypted queries. And the proving key will consist of the encryption public key and those encrypted queries. The verification key will consist of the secret decryption key, secret hence designated verifier, uh, and also the information you about how to check the queries. Now the prover, uh, given um, the x, y, and the w, or equivalently z, um, well, we started off with uh, a prover for a input, an input, input oblivious uh, linear interactive proof. Let's just run it and get the matrix. And we will homomorphically evaluate. Hey, where did that come from? Well, it just did. We will homomorphically evaluate the, um, a, the query using a suitable algorithm that will be granted to us by the special encryption scheme um, to compute the encrypted version of uh, the matrix C multiplied by the, uh, the encrypted queries. So we will need suitable homomorphism to do this kind of evaluation, and then we can send the encrypted results to the verifier. The verifier get these results and uh, will decrypt them using the secret key from the verification key, and then run the decision algorithm on the plain text answers and the information U that it got to make its decision. So this, this is, looks legit syntactically. Uh, we encrypt and then decrypt, and then uh, after this cancel out, what we get is uh, something that looks like the, um, the underlying uh, linear interactive proof. So completeness will hold. Um, but uh, we need the right properties from the encryption scheme. We need, uh, we need the ability to evaluate uh, a linear functions. We need this kind of homomorphism. But we also need uh, to make sure that nothing else happens. And this is the key point. This is where the, ma the true magic happens. Um, the encryption scheme has to be such that um, a, given a bunch of ciphertext, you can apply a linear function to them. But any attempt to do something else will create nonsense. So there's things that will be undecryptable or decryptable to random values. Um, so you have, to, in order to produce the, it's a, a new value meaningfully from the old ones, you have to know what you did. You have to know how to explain it in terms of linear combinations of the old values that you had. And this can be captured by a knowledge type assumption. Um, for example, um, you can take the Palier capture system and add a knowledge type assumption to it uh, to get the requisite property. Um, now, um, We've given up so far on public verifiability. It was only designated verifier, but as such, it works. Uh, we've also given up on zero knowledge, uh, but that can be fixed as well. And lastly, um, we only argued uh, informally about soundness. This is actually also provides proof of knowledge with uh, sufficient analysis and assumptions. Uh, we won't go into those details. Now, why do we go through the exercise? Uh, first, it's a warm-up for the real thing, uh, which is public verifiability. Um, but um, uh, just so you won't be too disappointed, let me give you a nice bonus. It turns out that what we've just seen already gives a strikingly succinct designated verifier snark. And uh, you can follow the same path, but starting not with QAPs, but with full-fledged PCPs. Um, and then by uh, applying randomized subset sum to them, you can get linear PCPs with just one query. And linear PCPs with just one query are trivially also linear interactive proofs because the inconsistency has no opportunity to show up for a single query. And uh, that gets you a designated verifier snark where the proof consists of just a single Palier ciphertext if you use this, specifically the Palier crypto system uh, with the knowledge assumption to make sure that it's uh, linear only homomorphic. So this is really cool, having a snark with such, such a synced proofs. Um, there's a catch. This starts with full-blown PCPs. So the verifier will have to actually evaluate a full-blown PCP and then compress it down using the randomized subset sum and moreover, these are really not the most efficient PCPs uh, that we know because they need to be query-efficient PCPs for the soundness to be good enough. 
So I wouldn't use it quite yet in practice, but it's still conceptually cool and comes for free from the analysis. <clears throat> what we really want, however, is publicly verifiable SNARKs. And that gets complicated because um, we wanted um, um, the fun encryption function to, um, a, to hide the, um, a, the information about the underlying queries to, you know, to ensure that um, the homomorphism is preserved and summers go through. But uh, we cannot have semantic security anymore in the public verifiability setting because uh, we actually need to test properties of the approver's answers and uh, testing any properties uh, of the ciphertexts that he produces would obviously violate semantic security. So we need some fancy encryption scheme with fancy assumptions. Um, First, we want to be able to somehow test things on ciphertext. We get encrypted results, encrypted answers, as in the designated verify construction. And now we want to test whether they have some structure, the one that the decider expects. And, uh, well, one of the uh, most popular ways to test properties of ciphertext is to put them into a pairing and see what comes out. Um, and that's indeed what we'll need. Uh, by linear map, uh, we'll be working with pairings over a suitable elliptic curve. And uh, that will actually, jumping ahead, dominate the runtime of the verifier. We'll also need some uh, a, a strengthening of the linear-only property, a linear-only homomorphism property that will require knowledge of exponent assumption, which is unfalsifiable, which is probably unavoidable, at least for black box reduction, due to, due to uh, gentry and weeks, as we heard earlier. Um, and we also have some technical properties about the underlying linear interactive proof. The decision in the query algorithm uh, needs to be low degree, which indeed holds for QAP, so we have it. Okay, so that actually, um, module of view of the details, concludes the description of the, uh, a, a, well, one version, uh, close to the state of the art for preprocessing SNARKs. Um, now, one thing that you may have noticed is that it was quite a journey through many levels of abstraction, um, and uh, it brings to mind uh, this publication by The Onion about uh, Frank Gehry no longer being allowed to make sandwiches for his grandkids. Those of you who hang around this data center know what I mean. Um, and uh, if you don't like all these layer of layers of abstraction that help you understand really what's going on, you can also look at this succinct representation of the protocol. This actually <laughs> contains all of the essential information, uh, stripped of uh, um, extra abstractions, and uh, also slightly more efficient. Um, there are also some assumptions. Let's let's be explicit about these assumptions. Um, so. Specifically, PGHR makes three assumptions. Other papers make very similar ones. Uh, they make the uh, Q power Diffie Hellman, which is a standard Diffie Hellman style assumptions. The uh, Q strong Diffie Hellman, which is the standard assumptions about uh, uh, pairings. Um, and uh, it also make the Q, makes the Q power knowledge of exponent assumption, which looks like this. Uh, not sure where this falls into the simple assumptions of earlier, but it's surely not falsifiable, and I can even tell by observing that um, there's a, an extractor hanging there somewhere, and uh, this fancy notation means that whenever the adversary outputs something, the extractor outputs something else that explains what the adversary said by way of linear combinations in the exponent. So that is the uh, poster boy for non-falsifiable assumptions, but uh, it has been used in at least two papers, so it's good. Um, there are several implementations of this protocol. Uh, these are the ones I know about. Uh, there's the original one by uh, the authors of uh, a GGPR and uh, PGHR, the Pinocchio paper uh, at Microsoft. Um, and uh, there is a, the implementation of our team, Skipper Lab, uh, consisting of uh, Alessandro Chiesa, Eli Ben Sasson, Madar Zriza, and others. Uh, that is called LibSnark. 
There is another one called Snark Leap, which is a bit funny. Uh, some, someone go, who goes by the pseudonym uh, Jan Carlson decided to take uh, Leap Snark, permute the name, and also change the C++ programming style. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is about backends. Uh, there are also many frontends that you've heard about and we'll be discussing a lot more tomorrow. Um, just to give you a few details about uh, Leap Snark, um, uh, naturally my favorite, um, and to try to actually show all of it. No, it's corrupted as well, okay? Um, so Leap Snark, so Leap -Snark uh, yeah, implements the um, um, the PGHR backend that we just show in that scheme, in that strange cryptic slide, uh, which uh, <coughs> is the compressed version of the verbose one we saw, uh, with some improvements like uh, a saving some pairings in the verifier and uh, reducing the verification key size. Um, it also some, has some additional backends that uh, we'll mention in a sec. And just to give you a feel for the numbers of where we are, if you um, start with a circuit with, uh, say, a million arithmetic gates, and uh, it has a thousand uh, bits of input, and you run it on a typical desktop, um, well, let's say uh, with 128-bit security, you'd be spending a couple of minutes running the generator once in a lifetime. That's a good deal. Um, you'll be spending a couple of minutes running the prover every time you have something new to prove. That's more annoying. Uh, the verifier is a matter of milliseconds, and as you can see, it uh, depends um, just on the size of the input, the X or Y, uh, and very mildly at that. So basically, you can treat the verification time as five or six milliseconds for all plausible scenarios. And the proof size is uh, 288 bytes for this security level. Um, this is uh, an, an open source project on GitHub under the MIT license. Uh, and is open to permutations of its name and programming style. <laughs> uh, it's also built upon by other projects uh, that we'll hear about tomorrow. Um, some uh, extensions, uh, there is the AdSnark extension uh, that uh, uh, adds the uh, built-in ability to authenticate data that is, that is computed on. This is something that you can always do as part of the SNARK statement, just checking signatures, but there are tricks to make this much more efficient uh, by treating the backend, the, the actual SNARK. Um, and uh, another recent paper um, proposes the square span program as opposed to a QAP, quadratic arithmetic program. Um, and that, is, uh, that provides a significant efficiency, efficiency boost for Boolean circuits. So these are independent works um, that done by others, and uh, they are now part of LeapSnark. Uh, AdSnark was uh, contributed by its authors, and uh, the FKG was uh, developed by Skipper Lab. <coughs> and uh, I see an indication that our time is up, but uh, I'd be happy to take questions um, and to pose open problems. So let's start with questions. The fifth query is uh, to make sure that uh, the string pi that contains 1, x, y, z, and uh, uh, h uh, actually contains x and y that the ver verifier is after. It could be uh, a wonderful proof about the, a different input or different output. So you need to fetch those values and compare them. So just take a random uh, well, depending on the query size, uh, you can. What we do is actually fetch them fully and uh, compare. Okay, so some open problems. Um, clearly, we need uh, more ideas. Uh, the QAP direction has been extremely fruitful, um, but uh, we need fresh ideas for doing things. Uh, in, uh, by conceptually different approaches, and in particular, um, this uh, the QAP approach seems uh, a, a very much uh, 
married to the world of preprocessing SNARKs, and uh, it forces us to have this uh, preprocessing. Moreover, uh, this preprocessing uh, is uh, uh, a trust issue. Uh, recall that um, the, the, what the uh, generator did is uh, to take queries and encrypt them. It knows those queries. If it ever reveals, reveals those queries, then uh, that would uh, break the soundness of the system. So uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the most important challenge uh, in, in terms of uh, functionality and security. Uh, and the other obvious one is performance. You saw the numbers. Uh, they're not a pretty sight. Uh, in million gates, it's not a lot of computation to be doing in two minutes. It's many orders of magnitude slower than native computation, as Mike showed earlier in his graphs. Um, it's good for some particular applications, but uh, um, we need new techniques that will avoid the, the very heavy cryptographic operations that are, need to be done inherently for these encryptions and the homomorphic evaluations and FFTs in this current approach. So uh, I urge you to uh, go to the uh, upper right in uh, Mike's slide in this sense as well. Thank you very much.